Thanks for joining us today. Oh, Thank God. you for having me. <laughs> I'm so excited to welcome Charlene and Eric to the show today. We have uh, the amazing Eric Stewart, who is the CEO or the executive director. Executive director. I always get that wrong. It's so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> of the American Rabbit Breeders Association. Thank you for being here. We also have Charlene. Do you all want to do a couple of intros, let people know who you are? Um, and then we'll, we'll do a little, uh, uh, intro to Manapro. So yeah, big thank you to Manapro for sponsoring today. All right. Yeah. Um, I'm Charlene Couch and I'm one of the senior program directors at the Livestock Conservancy. Um, we have 16 rabbit breeds on our conservation priority list that are endangered and need of your, uh, raising and support. Um, and I guess we'll, we'll be talking to Eric Stewart in just a few moments. Um, he has been raising rabbits since 1986. So I think he can give us some really good insight into to how to get started and also how to succeed as a breeder. Well, and I'm Eric Stewart. I'm the executive director for the American Rabbit Breeders Association. Uh, we have over 20,000 members worldwide, and we currently have 50 recognized breeds of rabbit and we're the largest rabbit registry on the planet. And I, I appreciate the mention of 86, although we'll just pretend that maybe I started raising rabbits the day I was born. There you go. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, well, before we jump into questions, we're gonna play a quick one minute video from Mina Pro, our awesome sponsor of Rabbit Chats this month. So please stick around. And then uh, if you have questions, go ahead and write them in the Facebook comments and we'll get to them soon. All right, stick with us. One minute. Champions, colleagues, roommates, and personal trainers. <laughs> Whatever role they play, they're an important part of our lives. In their quiet way. In their not so quiet way. <laughs> they keep us young. On our feet. On the go. They pull us back to nature and push us toward the next adventure. <laughs> and as much as we count on them, they count on us all the more. To nurture their lives with the same commitment. To protecting them, helping them grow and thrive. Treating them <laughs> as well as they treat us. <laughs> By giving them a little more of our lives. Because no matter what role they play, out here or in here, we're here to make their lives the best they can be. Manapro, Nurturing Life. Welcome back and big thank you to Manapro. Thank you for sponsoring Heritage Breeds and Rabbit Chats this month. We appreciate you. Um, and thank you for featuring all of our cool heritage breeders in that video. Next year, maybe we'll get some rabbits featured. <laughs> well, and just so you know, I all of my rabbits are fed Mana Pro. Oh, that's awesome. So, yeah. Nice. This that's year's good. convention, Best in Show, powered by Mana Pro. All right. That was exciting. <laughs> nice. So, Eric, um, you're the, the executive director of the American Rabbit Breeders Association. Um, Tell us what the 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 ARBA does and and what it means for rabbit rabbit growers and breeders and folks just getting started, especially. Well, one thing that sets us apart from a lot of other breed registries is the versatility of the rabbits. Um, the American Rabbit Breeders Association we promote every aspect of raising rabbits, whether it's from a companion animal, uh, commercial production, uh, fiber, and of course show. And we, we have the registry. So just like somebody may register their dog or their cow or their horse, um, we register the rabbits. We maintain the stud book. And, you know, any, any recognized breed, if someone's an ARBA member, they can register their stock, provided they have a three-generation pedigree. And they are an ARBA member. And then it is inspected. And that's one thing that sets us apart from a lot of other breeds or other species, rather, 
is that we don't necessarily, we don't register animals by birth. We don't register litters. Each rabbit must be inspected by a licensed registrar to assure, ensure that it meets the breed standard. And then once it's been weighed, inspected, then it's, it's tattooed with the insignia or the registration number. And then the application sent into us, we process it. And then they, each owner receives a very artful registration certificate that represents, you know, their animal being registered. We also sanction the shows. So anytime you go to something that's listed as an ARBA sanctioned show, there's a minimum set of standards for what you can expect at a show. It, the show will be judged by a licensed judge or multiple licensed judges. And it is judged only by the ARBA standard of perfection. And each breed has its own standard, which is essentially a recipe for the ideal specimen of that breed. So um, when you go to a show, it's not one of these things where eh, you roll the dice and it just depends on a, on a judge or what their thoughts are. Um, I have opinions like anybody else. In fact, I probably have more opinions than most people. <laughs> but <laughs> um, when I'm judging at the show, my opinions have to stay out of it. It's a matter of the standard. The standard is what dictates the ideals for each breed. So that's one thing as an owner going to a show, you have the you have these minimum expectations. So it's going to at least include this. So um, if you go any place, in fact, a lot of other countries now have even been adopting the ARBA standards, um, ARBA licensing processes, processes. Um, we even have folks who fly over to the United States because they don't have enough shows in their country to work their shows. And they'll fly over here and spend a month um, just so wow. they can work their shows. And then they go back to their country and they're able to officiate at shows or, or register for people. And that's how it's growing in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So, and also on top of everything we do with the actual rabbits, we have a lot of educational components. And that's a big part of ARBA membership is when somebody joins the ARBA, you not only receive your membership card, um, but you also get six issues of Domestic Rabbits magazine each year. So every other month you get a, a, a full color magazine that includes not only information about shows that have been occurring, but, you know, also breeding tips. Um, what do you do with waste management? You know, how do you grow worms? Most people don't realize that vermiculture, which is farming, worm farming, you know, rabbit manure is the best medium in which to grow worms. Okay. So you get this great um, byproduct of raising rabbits and um, articles on each breed and history, historical articles. And each member also, the first time member gets a copy of our guide to raising better rabbits and cavies, which quite literally is the most comprehensive book that exists on the planet for everything involving rabbits. You know, how do you wanna feed them and water them? What kind of equipment can you use? Um, and literally, anything that could involve rabbits. We even have the articles on raising worms. So <laughs> I love that idea. Yeah. Well, that's, and, awesome. and that's one thing a lot of people don't realize, you know, when we talk about rabbits being livestock, they may not recognize just the impact of raising domestic rabbits and, and what it has done for the human race. And it's not just here in the United States. I mean, he, even here in the United States, rabbits saved millions of people from starving over, you know, in history, uh, you look at World War II and we had rationing of meat and a lot of the rationing that occurred and rabbits were something that were small and productive and healthful that could live off the, you know, household scraps at that time. And people were able to have a protein, protein source, even though they may not have enough of their ration stamps to go get meat. And, you know, and, and I'm not dinging poultry. I love chickens. I love turkeys. I love <laughs> all of that. But rabbits are quiet. You know, if you live in a more urban area or you have close neighbors, um, rabbits aren't going to disturb anybody. And again, we've got that great byproduct. People want my rabbit manure. You know, when I clean my cages, how many people can you say, like, I'm going to give you some crap? And they <laughs> smile and thank you for it. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> so a lot of times this time of year, I get some of my composted rabbit manure and I bag it up and, you know, either employees here at the office or anybody else like come and they pick up rabbit compost and put it right in their gardens. Um, and that's one thing with rabbit manure, <clears throat> excuse me, rabbit compost is it doesn't burn your plants. I mean, it's, it's entirely safe. In fact, there's been many times where I've planted directly in rabbit compost, put the squash or pumpkin seeds in it, walk away and you get a great harvest. Wow. Oh, so, I love that. <laughs> so the, asking the, these rabbits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the ARBA, we represent every facet of, of the rabbit industry, hobby and fancy. Well, I, I was um, I, I was looking at your website the other day and I saw you list all your shows um, so folks can find something near them if they want to go check out rabbits and see what's out there and what sort of breeds, you know, they're interested in. Um, you list all those on your website and you also have some youth programs. Would you talk about those real quick? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, even with myself, you know, I'm a product of the ARBA's youth programs. Um, I may not have been born in the 86, but I, I, I was quite young. And <laughs> um, but we have a scholarship program. We have royalty programs. We have achievement management um, for, for anybody, any level of involvement. A young person doesn't necessarily have to be raising 25 or 200 rabbits uh, to be successful. Um, it, a lot of it has to do with, you know, learning and education. And I know that a lot of the things that were instilled in me as a young person, you know, responsibility, uh, care and concern for others, uh, even business management, you know, I had to be able to fund my rabbits from income from the rabbits and you know you would have to pay for your feed and you you kept all of that in your project books and of course i was also heavily involved in 4-h um but the, the rabbit educational programs we have an entire youth scholarship program where there are scholarship opportunities for youth arba members um to to compete and in, in, in win scholarships uh, and of course our youth royalty programs are huge um, not Tell me about just, that. What is what is the royalty program? Um, I was never the rabbit king. There, there have been. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't win that. Um, but what what you do? It's an entire interview process, and you're you're scored on your judging of rabbits. Hmm. Um, you have the interview, the judging, breed identification. Can you just look at a breed and know what breed and variety that is? Look at a rabbit and know that. Hmm. Um, and even the skillathon, you take an entire test and you have to answer these questions. What's the gestation period for a rabbit? Um, you know, what's the ideal temperatures for rabbits? And, you know, anything like that would be included. And then at our annual convention, we host a youth royalty contest. And that's almost like a lifetime achievement you know, award for some of the young people competing because they they competed since they were just a, a a little shaver, and then they go up and well, I won prince, but I didn't win, you know, king or I was the oh, duke no. one year, <laughs> and it all has to do with the age categories, mm -hmm. and just to see the excitement on the on the faces of the young people competing, and it it was quite a while ago. I remember competing and and just absolutely loving it, but then to to see the ones who win and just the tears of joy and um, the ARBA Youth Banquet is hosted a different night than the ARBA Open Banquet at each convention. And the attendance at the Open Banquet is not even half of what you will see at the Youth Banquet. <laughs> those, those rooms, we've had to go up sometimes 500 because there will be so many people packed in there. And it's actually my favorite night of the convention is to go in, see all those young people dressed up in their dresses and the boys with their ties. And um, then afterwards we have a great dance. And a lot of the adults, we stay and dance with the kids, you know, because yeah. that's what this is about is fun and fellowship. So well, it sounds like a great community. Of, yeah, we've got a little bit of something for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like that. Well, that's cool. Well, let's see where to go next. Um, we've talked about rabbit 
poop, <laughs> which is <laughs> and rabbit poop for worm growing. Um, can we talk about meat? Because I know that, you know, we, we, we always say, well, poultry is the, you know, the gateway animal into farming and a really rabbit is the gateway animal for livestock production, right? Oh, absolutely. And, and it's one thing that people don't realize is because of our culture and there's been shifts, you know, in, in some of our culture here in the United States um, and anthropomorphism has done a lot as far as impacting the, the, the meat considerations for rabbits. But it, again, if you look back in history, you know, rabbits were critical as to, you know, a lot of small households or farms and rabbit meat is it's the most digestible land protein there is. It's much more digestible than even poultry. And I, I, I eat lots of poultry. I should probably grow mm -hmm. feathers. <laughs> um, but it, if, if I had more ability and time to, to do a lot of my own rabbits, I would absolutely be eating more rabbit. I love rabbit meat. Um, and it's high digestibility, um, higher in protein than even your turkey or, ch or chicken. It's wow. very lean. And if you want to look at a feed conversion, you know, for what you get from a litter of rabbits versus other species, um, it's the most efficient as well. But one of the biggest hurdles to overcome is public perception. And I know that there have been some places that have taken, taken it off the shelves for, again, those, those types of pressures. But if, if this is like a home, somebody who's wanting to raise rabbits for their own personal consumption, um, very efficient, um, a doe easily can raise a, a litter of six to eight and in a matter of two weeks and at 70 days, you've got an ideal fryer. And those are those are rabbits that you don't have to do anything as far as tenderizing. Um, you can fry them right in the pan and they're fall off the bone tender. Yum. <laughs> yeah, I, I read somewhere that um, a single doe can produce, is it 200 pounds of meat from her offspring? Is that oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. wow. Yeah. Yeah. And when we talk about that average litter size of six to eight, that's an ideal. Um, you know, like I just had a litter born of 12 the other day and you would usually think like, oh, wow, that's really great. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, hold it together, girl, hold it together. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> you know, she just gets a little bit of extra because I didn't have anything to I didn't have other litters to foster to. So that's another thing I'll often do is uh, when you have those really large litters, it's good to foster. So each doe is only raising six to eight because then then you tend to get more uniformity in your litters. Mm -hmm. um, and as we're talking about you know commercial, the commercial aspect, we talk about uh, the meat. We can also talk about uh, fiber production. And that's actually my farm. I, I raise rabbits for wool. So I have Angora goats for mohair and angora rabbits for their wool. And I always say that if, if your significant other likes you, they're going to get you a wool sweater. But if they love you, they're going to get you an angora sweater. So, <laughs> <Love> it. <laughs> it's a luxury fiber. And it, it takes a lot of wool it, you know, to, to make up what you would get off of a sheep or even my mohair from the goats. But it's it's ultra fine, ultra soft. Um, I've yet to meet anybody who they, they may be allergic to the dander, but having Angora next to your skin, there's no irritation at all. It is silky, silky soft. Nice. Yeah. I, I, I know that you had a great photo with, with you and your, your beautiful Angora rabbit that you had run. I think you want to show, um, best in show or champion or yeah, she was the 2021 um, Open Best in Show at the annual convention last year in Louisville, Kentucky. And and actually, that doe is the one that has the litter of 12 at home right now. <laughs> <laughs> She's pretty and productive. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and even right before she had the litter, I, I could have taken her to a show the next day. Um, right before I sheared her, if, if they're correctly coded, it it just grows. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here I've gotten two shearings off of her and she just produced me 12 babies. 
And in another three, four months, she could produce me another 12 babies and I'd get another coat off of her. Right. So, you know, you, you just look at what rabbits can do for us, you know, and, you know, when people make remarks about like, oh, I just can't see doing that to a rabbit or that's their purpose. And you have to treat them well. My animals eat before I do. Mm -hmm. My animals are cared for before I'm cared for. You know, and that's where, you know, having a farm, our animals, they're our friends and our business partners and everybody has a role to play. Right. So, you know, when I, whenever I'm looking at them, that's precisely it is yeah. we're friends, we're business partners. It's my job to provide you with everything you need to, to thrive. And then I get something in return as well. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's it. I think for for homesteading folks that you know, it is great lean meat, and it's you know sort of a renewable resource in a way. Yeah. As long as you 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 keep up with your with your breeding, um, I don't know. It's it's hard to hard to see a downside for rabbits, except they're so dang cute. <laughs> you know, my little cat, but <laughs> but they're tasty. They're quiet. They they really take little space. They're low impact. Mm -hmm. You know, they they actually give give back great products. So um, it it sounds ideal for for folks who even with a small property want to have a, a source of meat or fiber or skins or or whatever. Just manure maybe <laughs> yeah well and and that's another thing when we talk about our youth programming um we have a class called meat pens and a meat pen is it, it's it's a single entry of three rabbits um they can be up to 70 days of age and which is the ideal fryer age and there has they have to all three be within three and a half to five and a half pounds and we're looking at uniformity so those three rabbits need to be uniform in size, um, their qualities. And of course, it needs to be a high quality flesh on them because um, the idea is they're not promising. The promise has already been made. You know, today's the day. And but you want it to be uniform so everybody gets uniform portions as well. Right. So and that's become a really big thing, particularly as we watch Urban Sprawl. A lot of the folks who, who were growing up, um, maybe they had a market lamb or they had a market steer or they were involved in 4-H and they could, could do some of these things, but they're not able to afford. It's not a matter of purchasing the animals. It's do I live at a in a location where it's zoned? I'm able to raise them myself. Right. So but rabbits, you can, you know, and this is a great way for a lot of these families you know, for their kids to experience what they experienced and the responsibility. And again, business. OK, this is how much I spent on feed. This is what how much I spent on equipment. This is what I made in the end. And, you know, this is what I learned through my project. So a lot of folks who maybe they can't have a market steer or a market hog, um, they're going they're switching over to rabbits. And even with poultry, and again, I am not dogging on poultry at all. I love chickens, <laughs> but um, they're noisy and they actually do create much more mess than what rabbits do. Rabbits tend to go to the bathroom in a very specific spot. And, you know, it's much easier to collect the manure from them than a chicken. So, and they don't make the noise and there's not as dusty. Mm -hmm. So if you do live in a residential area and you, you have some zoning that allows you to have them. Um, you can have a couple hutches or a couple cages and the kids still can compete in 4-H with their, with their meat pens. Yeah, that's a great idea. Let's, let's pause for a second. Brittany, do we, do we have any questions for Eric? We do. People are excited about rabbits. <laughs> that's awesome because we're also excited about rabbits. <laughs> Hi, Heidi. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah. Heidi says, hey, Eric, great to see you on here. So everyone's happy to see you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Gabrielle. Thanks for joining us today. We're glad you're here. Gabrielle says, does the guest know if Fort Worth Stock Show will offer heritage breed classes in early 2023? We're going to put you on the spot. Um, well, I would look that up on here because I, I do have access to all of the sanctions. But if it's... Um, 
because I think Fort Worth, I think that's the first weekend in February. And that's 2023. So they wouldn't have probably purchased their sanctions yet. So what you might want to do is get in contact with the stock show management to see if they're going to host it. What we call it, we call it the rare breed specialty show. And that's something that the ARBA adopted. We created this entirely new sanction just for rare breed shows. And that helps us promote um, some, some of the rare breeds and they get to compete into the specialty show, just those breeds. Now those breeds can absolutely compete in, in all of our all breed sanction shows, but this is just a rare breed specialty sanction. So that's what you would want to ask the stock show if they plan to get a rare breed specialty. Great, good question. All right, Dexter, thanks for joining us today. Dexter says the best part of ARBA is their educational resources. So heard it here first. They're amazing. <laughs> Hi, JC. Thanks for joining us today. JC says we use our rabbit poop around the farm as well. That's awesome. <laughs> Along that same line. Hi, Bonnie. Thanks for joining us today. Bonnie says, how do you collect the rabbit poop? Do you separate the hay and the pea? Well, um, that's actually a really good, that's a really good uh, distinction to make. I have a couple different sets. In fact, um, anything that's coming out of the pans, if, the, the, if there's no hay in it, I'll put it in one set because that's, that's your ideal compost. Now, most of my manure actually gets put right in the wheelbarrow and it goes out into another compost pile and that may have hay in it. The downside to, you know, composting anything with hay is that you get the weed seeds. So the gr good part about some of the stuff that's directly out of the pans, if it doesn't have any hay in it, that you can put right in your containers. In fact, I'll even put it right in pots. And, but the, the urine, that's something that tends to run out. It leaches out anyway. So I wouldn't be, be concerned with that. In fact, one thing you can do is if you just dig uh, not even two feet, maybe 18 to 20 inches down and get some pallets, take three pallets and set them up in like a, almost like in a closure, set them right up on their ends and then just keep dumping your, your manure in there. And as it builds up, because it's a pallet, you get more aeration around the sides and depending upon your climate to, to make compost, you need water. So you may need to water it occasionally and keep turning it. And at some point in time, it's going to turn into humus, just that we call it black gold, you know, um, and, and it breaks down beautifully. And especially if you've got it in that pile and you, you keep keep it aerated, keep it turned and watered um, within a year, it really does just look like potting soil. Wow. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Great question. Yeah. Thanks for going into all that detail. That's fabulous. Yeah. Hi, Sandra. Thanks for joining us today. Sandra says it looks like many of the heritage breeds would also be ideal for meat production. And that's true. It absolutely is. In fact, one thing that we're working on here at the office is we've got our grand opening. We moved from Bloomington, Illinois to Knox, Pennsylvania, and we moved all of our operations, our whole entire international headquarters are right here, 400 feet off of the I-80 exit. And we moved into, it's the original general store for, for this community. It was built in 1893 and everything is original. Wow. Um, we've been restoring it for the past year and we've been able to quadruple the space that we had in the ARBA library. And we're currently in the midst of the final stages of renovations for our grand opening, June 25th. So June 25th, <clears throat> will be our ribbon cutting uh, grand opening. We plan to cut the ribbon at 1.30 in the afternoon and everyone's invited uh, and you'll be able to go through and, and see, you know, rabbits from the time we had the Belgian hair boom in the late 1800s through to present in every aspect of it. In fact, uh, our library committee uh, has been out here planning out the displays and we have all of the floors have been refinished. We have 
the original built in general store furniture and a lot of the cases and everything, we're keeping them the period. So it's 1880s, which is also the time of the Belgian hair boom that started domestic rabbits as we know them today in the United States. So as I've been going through and needing to pull things out for them and looking for displays, um, you know, I've been finding all kinds of great stuff. And the thing is, these heritage breeds, I've been saying it for years. The last time I was on this, on your rabbit chat, I was talking about, you know, chinchilla rabbits are what built our current ARBA. You know, it was the breeding and the pelts and it's cheaper to raise chinchilla colored rabbits than it is to raise chinchillas. Mm -hmm. so there was an entire industry created by this. And it wasn't just the pelts, it was the meat and every aspect of it. You'd get magazines. I even remember, um, what's the, was it Ranger Rick or, or something like Boy Scouts? <laughs> like you had your, you could get a rabbit raising badge mm -hmm. and you'd go in and you'd find the classified ads and there'd be people selling New Zealand reds or sta best standard chinchilla rabbits in the country. And you could pay this amount of money and they'd ship them in. And I remember hearing the stories of, of folks who would order rabbits from the catalogs and then they would go down to the train station to pick up their rabbits in, in their crates. And they were that's how they got started. Wow. And um, so Sandra is absolutely correct. And would it be OK if I show just a couple of these yeah. pictures that I found? Absolutely. So this was in New City, New York. And please tell me if you can see this well enough. But like even on the roof of the building in the shingles, you can see the mention of chinchillas. Chin. That's awesome. Uh -huh. Yeah, it said um, chin breeders of America. And then I have another. This is another picture of one of their barns. And you can see they even have the sign on the front chin breeders of America. Very cool. So these are some things from the 30s where people were, you know, this was this was their thing. This was their entire livelihood. <laughs> and that's the gentleman in the center there. That's Jimmy Blythe. He was the ARBA secretary, which was the precursor to the executive director position that I currently serve in. Um, and he he was always a big promoter of the breeds. So Sandra hit the nail on the head when she mentioned, you know, some of the heritage breeds are great meat breeds. So as we're preparing to put together these displays, I just thought it was really neat that, you know, I found all of this stuff about the chins. That's so cool. Yeah. Yes, you'll have to share some of those. <laughs> Jeanette well, would love to get her hands on those, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and when you when you all have to come out and see see the see that library and museum whenever we get it all finished after yeah. the ribbon cutting, um, this this is going to be it. Yeah. You no, know? and yeah. we're having a lot of the things professionally done, and we're trying to keep things to period. And I can't share too much, only because our our library committee and you know curators have have asked that we keep some of the stuff for the unveiling, but it's really going to be something. I'm incredibly proud of the progress we've made thus far, but yeah. I'm, I'm excited to see what, what we're able to pull together for our members and, and, and even citizens throughout the United States who never realized how important rabbits are. Yeah. Brittany, why don't we get that on our, um, our schedule of events for, for folks to find. I already wrote it down. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go too. <laughs> well, and at some point in time, it would be great. Wouldn't it be great to do a rabbit chat here at the headquarters and we could even take you through the displays yes. and you, know, <laughs> you hear about the Belgian hares. It really was the Belgian hair boom in the late 1800s that created the domestic rabbit fervor, you know, in North America. Huh. So what was it about the Belgian rabbits that excited everyone? Um, it was a novelty. People had been raising domestic rabbits because a lot of the uh, immigrants coming over might bring rabbits with them, but they weren't always distinct breeds. But the Belgian hare, that was something that was a huge fancy. If you look at, you know, 1820s, 1830s, up until the eight, you know, 1900s, I mean, 
Britain had the or the UK, Britain, they pretty much had a huge uh, fancier for, for rabbits, um, the Polish rabbit. We call them Polish, mm-hmm. but the correct pronunciation is actually Polish because they are to be a neat, polished rabbit. Oh. And they're, that breed is what we call Britannia Petites here. But they, they had had their Dutch rabbits and Angoras. And it's really interesting as I've, I'm an Angora breeder myself, just digging into the history. Mm-hmm. Um, Angora rabbits were never in Turkey. They were not started in Turkey. That's not where they originated from. They originated in France. Mm. And it was actually the Brits that got a hold of them. They got, they got smuggled out of France because it was, it was a crime punishable by death. To for anyone to possess Angora wool that was only for nobility because the Angora wool the peasants were allowed to to raise it but any of the spun garments that was only for nobility because it was also supposed to help with um, social diseases so they would make your underwear out of it and and other garments (laughs) you know (laughs) <laughs> but once the Brits got a hold of it, because they had the Industrial Revolution in in Britain, so that's where the factories were. So they could ship wool over there at one point, but it could only be produced in France. So France mm-hmm. held the monopoly on wool until some of these got smuggled out. Then once the Brits started raising their own, they created another breed. So the original Angora rabbits looked more like French, the current French Angoras. Whereas it was the Brits that said, we need an opulent show bench rabbit. <laughs> so they would even put them on, they made these little stands and they'd put the Angora rabbit on it. And they're the ones that bred for the full coverage on the face, tassels on the ears. They just wanted a long, opulent coat. So just, just looking at how the Brits did the fancy, whereas France, and I raised French Angoras, so I always call them, they're the work mules. They're, they're <laughs> girls, you know, and the English, they're there to be pretty. So there's a purpose to everything. So it really was the Brits that were fine tuning some of these breeds that got America involved. Now, granted, a lot of this was going on in the European continent as well. But since we're English speaking, we tended to, to do a lot more business with the with the Brits. But the Belgian hares, that was a very distinct breed. And, you know, some of the folks involved, I mean, they would spend $2,000 on a buck in 1880. You consider that in today's money. It, it just turned into this big boom. And then people were just start importing stuff. And they would be importing some ones from Belgium, but they looked entirely different than the ones from Britain. They looked like, you know, racehorses. <laughs> so it, it was just really neat. And then then we had this this uh, influx of more rabbits and more breeds. And that's why it was 1910 when the Pet Stock uh, Association was started. And that was the precursor to our modern day ARBA. Okay. So over the years, more and more breeds became recognized. There were breeds that were recognized prior, but then they were determined to not really be breeds. It was just people trying to, to market things. So they pushed those back out. And yeah, the ARBA is very stringent as far as our rules on what constitutes a breed. It needs to be something unique. Um, we're not going to, we don't do these cross breeds and we're going to call it a designer rabbit breed. Um, there's an entire presentation process you have to go through that takes years. So, and, and what that is, is it allows breeders the, some assurance that, you know, these are, these are reproducible. This isn't a fad. That this has a purpose. And you really, when we even look at some of our rare breeds, you know, our the three chin breeds, your standard chin, giant chin, and American chin, they're all similar in their color. I mean, it's chinchilla. Mm-hmm. But they also have different different traits that make that set them apart. And you know, even looking through history, we've got Ed Stahl and the Million Dollar Rabbit. In fact, he wrote a book, The Million Dollar Rabbit. And he was a huge promoter of the giant chins. And out of the chin yeah. breeds for myself, I, I, I'm always partial to the standard chins. In fact, that may be my next breed. 
Ooh, all right. So I'm shopping <laughs> right now, but I've had my eye on the standard chins, and that's something I said before I retired. I wanted to raise them again, just because they're just a beautiful, simple rabbit, yet so complicated because of the color on their fur. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I expect that would be a fun, fun breeding challenge to to get the fur just right. Yeah. yeah. Well, cool. Um, let's see. Any any other questions we ought to pop over to and then we can. Come right we got a ton of questions so we can keep answering questions or sure. you can ask questions or it, it don't matter. Let's see. People okay. want to know all the things. We're just filling flim flam today and we're getting history lessons. We're getting all the great things. Yeah, yeah. Well, something cool and historic that I saw on your website is a book called 1001. Oh, is it ways to eat rabbit or recipes? Yes. Yeah, we, we have an entire cookbook for rabbits. So and that that's available through our online store um, or we can take phone orders. But yeah, it's it's specifically recipes for cooking rabbit yeah that that looked really intriguing to me <laughs> all right let's see going going to that um jc wanted to know if you've got a, re a meat rabbit that you recommend um not in particular i mean in, in all honesty uh, i know people will say that well, this breed, in fact, I heard this over the weekend, they were referring to Champagne d'Argent's as being the Angus of rabbits. Uh, they all taste the same. But if you if that's how you want to market something, that's good for you. Um, out of all the commercial, what we what we deem as commercial breeds, um, my personal favorite are Champagne d'Argent's. I mean, they just put mm -hmm. that because I and I raised hundreds of, of champagnes at one time. And we would go through and we would process 50 in a day and just the density of meat. They're not always as deep in body. You might not get as much as as long of a loin strap. Whereas you look at your New Zealand's, you've got a little longer frame. You've got a longer framed animal. Uh, your New Zealand's and Californians are probably the most popular of the what are deemed commercial rabbits. My personal favorite, though, are the champagnes, and they're just so pretty to look at. You see, see them babies, and they're black, and then they silver out when they get older. Mm -hmm. um, so, really, any of the breeds, and you—I love silver fox. You know, that's another great, great be breed that you know you're not only breeding; you can breed them for show, and then you get to eat the other ones. Mm -hmm. So, um, really, Palominos. It, you just go through a lot of these heritage breeds. As Sandra White had mentioned earlier, are great for for meat production. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hi, hi, Randy. Thanks for joining us today. Randy wants to know what are your thoughts on getting rabbits for your kids for Easter? That's coming up. Thank you for that, Randy. Getting rabbits or giving rabbits as a gift for Easter is one of the worst things anyone can ever do. Um, you know, if you, especially if you're looking at rabbits as, you know, a companion, you know, they can live to be five or seven years old, you know, and there's far too many animals that end up, you know, being discarded for one reason or another, um, once the holidays passed. So what I always encourage folks to do is, you know, if you want to get, get a family, you know, a rabbit for Easter, how about you get them a membership to the ARBA? It's going to be cheaper mm -hmm. than the rabbit. It provides educational information for the family to make an informed decision. You know, is a rabbit going to be right for us? What breed is going to be right for us? Um, not all rabbits make great pets. In fact, we have specific breeds that were developed and bred just to be pets. So um, it's just like shopping for a dog or a puppy. You know, you need to look at what's going to be right for my family. What, what, what do we plan to do? Can we handle this? So, and I know that some folks, I'll probably catch heat for this, but I wouldn't get a family, a New Zealand wife for a pet. You know, there, there might be some nice ones out there, but that might be better as a 4-H project, you know, versus, you know, having a pet. You know, you look at some of the breeds like the Holland Lops and, you know, Fuzzy Lops and, well, even fr big French Lops and English Lops. Every kid in my family that ever had a pet rabbit always got an English Lop. And it didn't matter if they were five years old and they were getting an 11 pound rabbit, you know, it's, it has to do with their personalities. 
Um, you know, a lot of times people will think that, well, I want to get something really small because, you know, my child's only six or seven years old and I want something that they can carry around. Why are you leaving a child unattended with a rabbit to carry it around? <laughs> you know, that it's just never a good idea. The best place to handle and play with and engage with the rabbit is on a table or on the floor. You know, and those big, those big lops, they're just big, goofy cuddles, you know, and they love attention. You put them down on the floor with the kids and they'll probably follow the kids around. So you don't think of some of these big rabbits as necessarily being so docile, but they tend to be more docile. Mm -hmm. So great, great comment. Great question, Randy. Absolutely. Hi, Edwina. Thanks for joining us today. Edwina wants to know what Manapro feed are you feeding your Angoras? <laughs> well, it's just, it, it's Manapro Pro. And, you know, one of the mistakes that most rabbit breeders make is thinking that you have to give a high protein. I, I like a 16 or less protein, and that's regardless of breed. Um, the number one thing to consider is giving hay. Um, you know, as much hay and fiber, because that's what's natural. You look at their GI system. What are they meant to eat? And, you know, rabbits don't need a high protein diet, you know, and if they do need something additional, like the white widow, that doe with the 12 babies, she's getting lots of black oil, sunflower seeds, <laughs> as much hay as she'll eat. Um, but it's still, it's a 16% protein. And I've been using the same feed for probably 12, 13 years at, at this point, and I've never changed. Wow, that's a good endorsement. That's awesome. I'm going to go a little bit deeper. Hi, Colleen. Thanks for joining us today. Colleen wants to know, do you add any additional supplements? And do you have anything different for your seniors? And if you prefer hay or cubes? It's a multi-part question. Oh, no, that's great. Um, well, I shared, you know, it's in it. And it really, it, it comes down to, is your feed fresh? You know, is your feed fresh? Is it consistent? And you know, regardless of a brand, 16%, 15%, um, that, that's actually ideal. And I do give supplements. And I, I want to clarify something. I am not I do not, I do no paid endorsements for anything. I pay full price for everything I purchase and feed my animals. So, um, but the best thing I've, I've run into has been, it's, it's a product called oxygen. Well, it's made by oxygen, but it's called immunize. And it's got basically building blocks for amino acids, immunoglobulins. And, you know, I just use a little pinch on top of their feed each night. And it's taken my litter mortalities and dropped them 90%. Um, that's a 90% drop since I've started using it. And that's, that's really the only supplement I do. They'll get a pinch of immunize on top of their feed. And I don't free feed. Um, they get anywhere between a half to a cup, depending upon the rabbit, each day. And I tend to, in the evenings, I'll immunize immunize everybody who gets immunized, then I give liberal amounts of hay. And I know that people think like, you know, Angora breeders that we would hiss if somebody had hay, but th they need it more than anybody, any other breed does really. And I just, I, I ball it up really tight and make a little tail at the end and stick it in the cage, in the cage door, and then they eat it off. And then in the morning, I give them their pellets. So what I'm wanting them to do is get their immunized and get all of that roughage from the hay and they can nibble on that all night and they've got that rolling around in their cecum. And then in the morning they get their pellets and then they can digest all of that. But I know that their gut has been cleaned by the, by the hay and the roughage first. Hmm. Um, and I do, especially particularly breeding does, if they don't have a litter on them, I tend to try to keep them a little leaner. So those are the ones that might be closer to the half, three quarters of a cup versus a cup. Um, your younger animals, they need to grow. I mean, they, they need more nutrition because their, their bodies are growing. And that's actually a reason why I oftentimes will shear down my juniors, like my young ones, 10, 12 weeks, eight weeks sometimes, I shave them down so they don't have the burden of the wool on their body 
and they actually get a chance to grow. And I do the same thing with my goats. Once I started shearing the, the kids and my young rabbits, I just noticed that they perform so much better. They grow better. They don't have that burden of hair, you know, on them. I, I call it uh, wool tolerance. You know, they have to have good wool tolerance to be able to handle that. And you'll see that with sheep and other, other species that grow long coats as well. If you cut them down when they're younger, they just grow better. And once their body's set, okay, now you got to finish the rest of your job. You got to grow me some wool. <laughs> and as far as um, my hay, Timothy is great. I try, to, I try to use as much orchard grass as I can. I tend to get a take a more holistic view of husbandry. I don't like if I can avoid a lot of process things I do. And that's my issue with hay cubes. Um, they tend there tends to be a lot of waste and you get those little chunks and it's going to be running around through the cage and it gets caught in their wool. And it's also been processed. They have to heat heat a lot of things in order to get them compressed. So just as natural as we can. And you even heard black oil sunflower seeds for a lactating dough. It's what nature does. Hmm. That's great. All right, a couple more questions as we wind down the hour. Uh, hi, Trillia, thanks for joining us today. Uh, how do you keep your angoras in ideal temperatures during the hot summer months? I know a lot of rabbits need to stay cool. Um, actually, heat is the biggest killer. Um, it is, it's the worst thing. and. Again, because I don't have a lot of things that are they're fabricated. I, I do a very natural approach to things. Um, I just try to keep a lot of airflow, keep things dry. And um, that, that's the biggest thing I can do. And I do have a lattice up around my rabbitry on the western side where the sun's coming in. And I'll grow vines over it anything to shade the rabbitry. And I even have a, a tree that I keep pruning to a certain, you know, in a certain configuration to keep as much shade on the, on the rabbitry as possible. Um, it's great to do air conditioning. Um, I have maintained them in air conditioned, you know, areas either in a basement or I just built a biosecure rabbitry just, just due to the concerns with RHD recently. Um, but I, I, I'm so big on ventilation. A lot of times people, when they look at their rabbit trees, they say, well, I want these cages and this is how I want things set up. But they don't always consider the fact that rabbits need regular air changes. You know, um, I had some film crews in a few months ago and they remarked in the rabbit tree, they're like, it doesn't even smell in here. Well, ideally it shouldn't because mm -hmm. ammonia, and because rabbit urine is very high in ammonia, when you close that in, whether you're trying to heat it or air condition it, um, that ammonia gets in the, the air through moisture particles, you know, in the air. And that's actually, it burns their noses, it burns their sinuses. So when you're looking at raising rabbit, it's, it's not just what are we going to feed them? What do we want to do with them? How are we going to keep them with fresh air as, as much as possible? So I have found that even when it's in the 90s, uh, that convention best in show though, she was not in air conditioning at all. She was in my rabbitry with the rest of the rabbits when it was 90, 95, 100 degrees and 80% humidity. And it was just a matter of, well, it's also an insulator. And if we keep the airflow and keep things as dry as possible in the building, then um, there's not as much stress. Yeah. Are there instructions for housing and, and there's kinds of considerations on the Arbo website? Um, we actually have, we have the minimum care guidelines on the website. <clears throat> However, if you join the ARBA, you get that entire guide to raising better rabbits and cavies, which includes everything. And it, it's not just for outdoor hutches or indoor cages. It's all the different cage types. Do you want to water them with Crocs? Do you want an automatic watering system? Do you want to use water bottles? Like it covers the gamut. That's great. What fabulous advice. That's amazing. All right. I'm going to wrap it up with Lauren's question about what breeds need the most support right now. Well, that would be something that I, I think maybe yourselves might 
uh, be able to answer a little bit more because that's that's more of a conservancy, the livestock conservancy um, thing. Before we started the show, Lauren, um, good to see you. <laughs> um, the giant angoras. When we're looking at the angora breeds, because uh, Brittany and Charlene had mentioned, you know, are there any fiber breeds listed on the rare breeds? And we don't have any currently listed on the on the rare breed list. But you know, the giant angoras. There's not the breeding pool that there um, the other angoras breeds have right now. They just don't have the numbers. There's not as many people raising them to even have the biodiversity or genetic diversity that we do in some of the other Angora breeds. Um, but one thing I can say, since we've been getting involved with the Livestock Conservancy and we've got the, the rare breed specialty shows and the interest in heritage breeds, um, I've seen so much more interest. Like uh, I could I could go years without seeing a Blanc de Oto at a local show. The only time I would see them would be at an ARBA convention and they might have 10 or nine. Whereas now we've got specialty clubs and I'm, I'm seeing that the, the Blanc de Otos and the Dwarf Otos, they're going together and having specialties and the people are conversing back and forth. And, and I've seen such a resurgence with the Silver Fox. When I first got my judge's license, I think it took a few years before I even touched a Silver Fox. Now I've picked them for best in show in an all breed show. Wonderful. You know, and we, we've got these breeders. They're, they're not raising good rabbits. They're raising great rabbits. So, you know, you just see see some of this by bringing things to the forefront and catching people's attention. You know, it 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 gets some of these breeds that maybe folks hadn't always thought about and it puts them out at the forefront and it builds the excitement and competition breeds quality. And my friend Deb Morrison from Oklahoma, she said, what is it? steel sharpened steel and <laughs> that's one of her oklahoma sayings but uh it's totally it's absolutely true and you know the more people we have involved the more competition the higher the quality of the animals and it it's a win-win for everybody yeah agreed agreed you, you guys have been such great partners for um for for us for rabbit conservation because i'm hearing the same stories that you know, people who who were one of the few representatives at a particular of a particular breed at a show a few years ago. Now they go and there are 40 of those. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, so so it's a it's a great partnership with with you guys being able to put on the shows and to, to sort of single out and highlight the heritage breeds that are on our conservation priority list. Great. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to plug the conservation priority list on our website, mm -hmm. livestockconservancy.org. There's a whole section on rare breeds. We have a list of just rabbits, um, so you can see which ones are critically rare and which ones are doing okay but still need a little bit of support and uh, learn more about those. Yeah, we also, um, we also have on there a, a breed comparison list that you can either view or download and print. Um, those comparison lists are really cool because, you know, they, they really give the, the specs on each breed and, and let you know what to expect from them and, you know, in terms of size and um, that kind of stuff. <laughs> what's, what's what they need, really. So It's really helpful when you're trying to determine, like, which breed is right for you and your homestead and your goals and what you want to do. Yeah. That's what I tried to say. <laughs> <laughs> we got there. It's fine. <laughs> well, as we're wrapping up, Eric, is there anything else you'd like to promote? Or it's our shameless plug section. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My specialty. <laughs> well, one of the big things, and, and particularly you know, coming into this today, knowing you know, I got to speak with you all on the, with the Livestock Conservancy, is you know, a lot of our our breeds that are listed as rare breeds or heritage breeds are breeds that help to build the ARBA. And, you know, I, I mentioned about, you know, we're working on the, all the displays that we're going to be developing and, you know, the ARBA, we have ARBA incorporated, which I'm the executive director, but then we also have the library foundation and that's a separate 501c3 foundation. And that's what funds our efforts in the library and with the 
library and museum. So if anybody wants to be able to, if anybody who can contribute to the foundation, that would be fantastic. And it actually helps to promote our heritage breeds because those are a lot of the breeds that are, are being featured in these displays. So um, you can contact us, you have our, our web address. Um, and since the, if, if, you den, if you denote that your donation is for the library foundation, Again, it's a 501c3, that's a charitable contribution, and we certainly appreciate it. And we invite everyone to come learn about rabbits and the history of rabbits in, the, in North America. That's awesome. Yes, please do. And that's arba.net if you're just listening in. So please check it out. Go there, send them some money, uh, you know, help them promote rare breeds and all the awesome things that they're doing. I love all the history stuff we learned today. I am so excited to come visit eventually. <laughs> gonna hold you to it. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be fabulous. We're just gonna geek out. Like we'll just make a trip, a road trip, all of us. And we're just like, oh, Rabbit your you nerds for your night. So amazing. Um, I also want to say uh, thank you to all of our members and supporters. We couldn't do this without you. Um, you help support educational programming, things like this, and chats like this, and other programs that we have going on throughout the year. If you're interested in becoming a member, you can just go to our livestockconservancy.org. You'll learn more about that. We'd always love to welcome you into the community. You could do it once a month at $4 a month. I know I spend more on coffee, like probably every day. <laughs> Then, um, then it costs to become a member, and then you get to participate and join in, and know that you're supporting people that are helping change the world. So we appreciate you. That's the rest of my shameless plugs for today. Unless I'm forgetting anything, Charlene. I don't think so. Thank you so much, Eric. This is oh, this is always a treat. I I always enjoy learning about about what y'all are doing. It's it's so expansive, and it, it's such a great marriage with what we do. Great. Well, we, we thank you for everything that you do and thanks for having me and look forward to doing it again. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you again soon.